<laughs> so Peter, where are you, Peter? There you are. I'll get you. Okay, you got it. <laughs> One of the many ways that Alex has impressed me in our discussions over the last few months now, actually, some of you may remember that Alex actually came to our club, was it September, October last year? Uh, August last year. And uh, went through the process of becoming a member at that time, um, but unfortunately his work schedule wouldn't allow him Wednesdays off. But he went through all the process, the checks and the publishing in the paper, and uh, in our spur, and was sort of ready to go. And then he couldn't come, but uh, about a month ago, we resumed our relationship, and so now he's got he's had permission to have Wednesdays off, so here he is. One of the many ways that Alex has impressed me in our discussions has been his eagerness to help in community projects. So, Paul Schmid, wherever you are, there he is. I encourage you also to talk to Alex about helping with the rodeo play. <laughs> and there are lots of other folks out there I, I can see and spot uh, that Alex can be very useful to us all. Now, let me tell you just a little about Alex. He's a graduate of Stanford last year and is working as a manager at Costco on a career fast track. He would have joined the club earlier, and I've already told you about that. Uh, and his work day at that time, uh, his work day now, I think, starts at 4 a.m. and ends at 3. Close enough? Close enough. His home is in Seattle. His home is in Seattle. He is the son of Vietnamese immigrants who came to this country via Malaysia in 1969. Boat people, if you remember that term. Alex, as a member of Rotaract, you are already aware of some of our activities, but now as a fully-fledged member of this club, you will be in the next two seconds, <laughs> at RI, you are invited to become even more involved. Our club members, I am proud to say, work on many projects, so committee heads, not just those two I've mentioned, don't be shy, look to Alex to include him, and he's not shy, I can guarantee that, on one of your teams. Remember, improving lives is not just about working on projects, it's about developing relationships, both personal and by default business. This clothing, do you want to just give it to him so I can handle it? I usually call this paraphernalia, but uh, it's sometimes misconstrued. <laughs> this clothing and hardware, the yellow vest and the rotary pin, are to be worn with pride, Alex. The vest will, ad will identify you as a Rotarian, <clears throat> as a Rotarian when working on a project and the Rotary Pin does the same. So Rotarians, please welcome our newest guy, Alex Lee. probably never heard John Sarbereri speak, but he's going to do it today. <coughs> it's going to give you a new member talk. <laughs> old member. <laughs> he's an old new member. <laughs> Alex, one day I brought in most of you. Well, you haven't heard me speak, I haven't really missed too much. <laughs> John, I am a... Uh, John Sabarari, very easy last name. I can't, can't, can't hear you. Oh, close. No, it's not true. Check the Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's all. One day. I might have. You've broken the record. I was born in San Jose, California, last century sometime. My parents are came to the United States from Italy to get a better life. They moved to Livermore when I was one year of age and operated a downtown bakery on First Street for many years. I attended St. Michael's School. This was a four room, had four classrooms with eight grades, and the wonderful Dominican nuns who taught us did a wonderful job and were a great, great group of people. I attended Livermore High School long before Granada ever appeared. Uh, I was active in many school activities. I played sports, but I was pretty small, so therefore junior varsity is what I had to do, and I learned in, in basketball and track. 
And my other great accomplishment was I was student body president my senior year. Uh, my uh, chemistry teacher, due to my interest in pharmacy, had got me a job at the Duarte's Pharmacy, one of the two pharmacies in Lookmore at that time. Uh, after graduation, I felt a little intimidated about UC Berkeley because our class, our total enrollment was like 300 students, and Berkeley was like 25,000. So I chickened out. <laughs> And I attended Santa Clara University, a great school, splendid, uh, well, tested as well with Carol and Siegfried. But I was there for a year, I was uh, accepted to Cal, Berkeley, and transferred to the pharmacy school at, uh, at San Francisco, UCSF now. ROTC was mandatory for all university students, so I was called to active duty and sent to South Korea assigned to the 7th Division, 48th Art Field Artillery, and my title was Battalion Surgeon. And I asked the said, well, you know, I'm a pharmacist. You know, well, the guy you replaced is a history major. He wants to get out of there. And <laughs> <laughs> so, I did not perform surgery, but I had a sick call every morning for the troops. And we had all kinds of things, uh, cuts, respiratory infection, gold bricks, of course, a lot of, a lot of VD. Uh, we also had Korean sick call in the afternoons, and mainly it was mothers that came from a, a very tiny little village that was pretty much a bunch of shacks. And they brought their children up there because these shacks, they had... The only heat they had was an open fire on the dirt floor, and there was a lot of burns, so we saw them and took care of them. <coughs> Let's see. Okay. At the end of my 16 months of tour on the DMZ, I returned to the U.S. and was discharged uh, after my two-year commitment. Returned to Livermore and went to work with my old employer and became a partner and practice pharmacy in Lutmore for 55 plus years. Wow. I've been active in various pharmacy associations and was a past president of the Alameda County Farm Association. I married Barbara, my wife, in 1969, the same year I became president and was demoted. So <laughs> I have uh, three grown sons and one grandson. I joined Livermore Rotary in 1958, sponsored by Ed Renstrom. Some of you remember Ed. Oh, yeah. I'm past uh, president and a longtime member and a great instructor and uh, superintendent of schools for a number of years. I've been a member of, of this club for 55 years. Oh, wow. Um, only, <coughs> only longer it was, it was John Shirley so far. Uh, I hope he sticks around a long time. <laughs> It's a great organization with very active members doing a lot of good work in the community and the world. And it's been a great pleasure to be an associate with such a group of great people. And thank you, and go Bears. <laughs> thank you, John. Peter Polson. Uh, we have been looking for a hands-on project uh, for some time, and uh, one has come to us. Uh, basically, it's a handicapped person who needs access to her bathroom, uh, her shower, and to the clothes washer and dryer. Uh, she, really, she lives in a three-bedroom house, but it has a very, very tiny bathroom, as you will see. Um, what we will do is uh, convert an existing bedroom <coughs> to make a new bathroom and, uh, and wash and dry a room. And uh, this uh, house remodeling will make a huge difference in the quality of her life. And she is extremely excited about the, the prospect. Uh, this is a, part, a project between our club. Uh, Stephen F. is a designer, and in a second he will come up and show you the drawing. Uh, we also have a contractor scope that we have worked with before on our uh, hands-on jobs. Uh, they come from the Cornerstone Church, and uh, the project there is headed by Jim Coots. And uh, we also have a realtor, Judy Irvin, who is a friend of the family. <coughs> and she has uh, connections to a whole bunch of other contractors 
who tend to do the things at cost and and uh, make make uh, the project affordable, and uh, and whoever else that can get to, get to work on this, uh, we accept uh, anybody who can push a boom, who can wield a hammer, who can do anything, a paint. So uh, please contact me uh, uh, as soon as you can, and uh, we can uh, start doing the planning. Uh, so Steve, would you like to talk about? It? Steve, you want a pointer? You want a laser pointer? Uh, sure. Teach me how to use the top button there. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, you saw a picture of this bathroom being expanded, and we decided that didn't really solve all the problems. So what we're now doing is putting a door here to create a suite, so that what was two bedrooms back here will now be a master suite. We're expanding the hallway. And that's about the limit of the structural work that we have to do, is to get this hallway big enough for a wheelchair to be able to turn around in. Uh, we're going to put the washer and dryer, which currently are out here in the garage, inside the house. Um, a nice counter to fold clothes on. The shower is going to be a rolling shower, so there'll be no bump there to go over with the wheelchair or, or trip over. Uh, grab bars, the toilets here, the sink, and uh, all the electricals shown in there pretty simple project. It's actually going to be cheaper to do this big room here than it was going to be to try and expand the little room there. So I think it all worked out. Wow. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> that over again. <laughs> Next project. Next project. Okay, wrong button. Next one. There we go. Uh, your present uh, program chair has decided that it's probably time for some uh, new blood, uh, uh, starting with Millie's term. Uh, I've been doing this for, for that. by then I'll probably have done 182 meetings. So <laughs> I think it's about time. But I, I want to make sure that I thank the program committee. And this is the kind of job that uh, certainly I couldn't do without, without a really strong committee. And uh, you can see, see who's on. John Shirley, uh, Kathy Slater, Kathy Coyle, Jay Davis, Chuck Hardwick, Lee Yonker, Lynn Seppler, Melly Seibel, uh, Phil Dean, Ron Koopman, Sheila Facciano, Susan Mayo, John Sailors, Bill Nebo, of Sherman and Jackie Williams Cordright. So I really want to thank them. Uh, also, all the others who have forwarded ideas. I often get ideas uh, <laughs> through Kathy Coyle and John Gordon because uh, they're on, on the website. I get a lot of referrals. And thanks to all of you here in the club who have presented programs. <clears throat> it's all of you who make all these programs possible. Uh, do we have another one? That's it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so we are now looking for a new program chair. It's, uh, so you might consider this. It's going to be a, it is a very interesting job because you're involved with virtually everything that, uh, that, the, that the club is doing. Uh, if you have a program that you see that it's, that's in trouble, uh, that you can help in some way, you do that. Uh, Sometimes you need to change programs, sometimes you have cancellations the day before, you need to deal with that. Uh, but please contact uh, Millie, myself, or Sheila Fabiano uh, if you're interested in the job, and you can certainly talk to me about uh, what's involved. So, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Paul, are we having a rodeo parade? We are. But first I want to say that the rumor that I'm stuck in Ukraine is greatly exaggerated. It is no fun getting your hat, and I apologize. But anyway, the parade, June 14th. It's coming quick. Uh, I'm going to be sending to John Gordon pretty soon uh, to get our applications printed up. So you're getting down to the end if you would like to be a sponsor and be your name listed on at least on our applications. You need to get that into me in the next few days. 
but soon I will be asking for lots and lots of help. So, I'm still looking for sponsors, and start thinking of anyone who you might want to ask to be in the parade. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Phil. I want to be up here so I can look at you, uh, to <laughs> uh, the reason why I'm up here, uh, I'm not getting too many sign-ups. I have about, about 18 people right now. I need your help. I really need your help. We have a senior work day on the 26th of April. We're going to start at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, it's a combined effort of the morning rotary and us. So far, only five people volunteer from the morning club. So with 16 people here, only 19. That's one per senior. That doesn't help us at all. We want to get this thing over with by 12 noon. Basically, we're going to go around, basically, and simply help the seniors, you know, with house chores. It could be, you know, trimming the lawn, mowing the lawn, or if they're bad, or whatever it is, you know, and it's a fun job, frankly. If you are not here last year, if you're new, if you're, if you're a red badger, that's a great opportunity. It is heartwarming. It changes you. When somebody cries on your shoulder that you came to help out, it's amazing what it does to you, I'm telling you, because these people don't have the help. So I'm begging you, I have a clip about going around. If you can help me sign up, just three hours, you're done. You know, I promise you it will be fun in the morning, breakfast, there will be lunch in the afternoon, I'm going to tell the stories. Tell us what was heartwarming for you. Let's put the smiles on this on their face, please. So please help me sign up. We need at least 38 people, at least two per family, to get the things done so fast. So you have a buddy. Please help me do that, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul Brown. Paul Brown. Mary Green and Dave Griner, come on up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dave Griner, come on up. Bird Green. As you probably guessed, these are multiple Paul Harris fellows that I'm awarding today. Uh, Vern, uh, there's yours. Congratulations. You have a Paul Harris Fellow plus two pin. And Dave, you're a Paul Harris plus five. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, it's due to the past generosity of, of, of men like this that the Rotary Foundation is making it possible for kids to read and more villages to have pure water and all the other projects that the Rotary Foundation does worldwide. Yeah, and remember that these awards that I gave out today are just a recognition that, that we have given to the Foundation. The truly lasting recognition is what our donations actually accomplish. I'd like to remind you that we're in the middle of our drive for Polio Plus. Our goal is $8,000 and we are currently at $6,600 uh, from club member donations. Now that's $1,400 to go. And remember that for uh, each $10 you donate, uh, you qualify for a Mother's Day card uh, that District 5170 is putting together. Uh, and in addition to that, donations at or above $100 will get matching points towards your next Paul Harris fellow level. So you may be able to join uh, uh, men like the two you just saw up here at, uh, at a future meeting. I have placed pledge cards on the, each of the tables to make it easier to give. Uh, you can give them to me after the meeting or to, or to Sheila. I look forward to um, your help. If you have any questions about where you stand on your Paul Harris fellow level, see me after the meeting and I'll, I'll try to dig that information out. Thank you, Paul. Today, you know, is Youth and Government Day, and we have the honor of having Troy Brown, acting city manager, to tell us all about it. Good afternoon, everyone. It, it's a pleasure to be here. Really, this is one of the, uh, my personal favorite days of the year. Um, and as mentioned, each year the city does toast Youth and Government Day. Youth and Government Day is an opportunity uh, to expose youth from the Livermore Valley Unified School District to all facets of local government. 
in the morning that you spend time with not only us, but also with our, our partner representatives from LARPD and the Livermore Valley Unified School District. So this is a partnership. And I want to thank our partners for their participation every year in the Using Government. Also each year, the youth spend time with you, and you guys have been great partners as well. Rotary is one of the most important partners that we have, not only because of the phenomenal things that you do in the community, but because of your lunch as well. <laughs> so I want to thank you for your generosity in that as well. Thank you very much. And just a heads up, uh, I was at the, at the morning Rotary on Tuesday morning, and I saw that on the table uh, the announcement about the, bot the upcoming bocce ball tournament. So I would recommend, uh, and this is a little insider information, uh, you folks practice because the Tuesday morning Rotary is taking this thing pretty seriously. <laughs> Just a little, little heads up for you. Uh, I would like to take a moment, though, to introduce uh, the youth today and have them each stand up, tell you their name, what school they're from, and also who they shadow today, so that we all have a sense about uh, who's here in the room. So I'll start over here at my left, and we'll start with your name, your school, and who you shadow, please. Um, hi, I'm Chelsea Bartlett. I go to Granada High School and I shadowed uh, Mike Harris, the uh, police <coughs> chief. Oh. Okay. I'm Michael Duterte. I uh, shadowed John Marchand today, the mayor, and I go to Granada High School. I'm Alana Hindia. I'm a senior at Granada High School and I shadowed Bob Coomber, um, the LARP. Um, LARPD board member. Hi, I'm Emma Nakuchi. I go to Granada High School. I shadowed Lynn Gardner, the family therapist at Horizons. I'm Carissa Allen. I go to Granada High School and I also shadowed Granada. I'm Haley Smith. I go to Granada High School and I shadowed Bob Coomber of the Parks and Recreation Department. I'm Sophie Hartley. I'm a senior at Granada High School, and I shadowed the um, fire chief, Jim Pico. I'm Erin Business. I'm from Granada High School, and I shadowed Kelly Bowers and Ann White. I'm Tristan Berman. I followed Tamara Labu. Labu. Uh, she is the director of library services. I'm Hannah Mata, and I go to Granada, and I shadowed. Kelly Bowers and Ann White. Uh, I'm Steven. I go to Granada and I also shadowed Kelly Bowers and Ann White. Good afternoon. My name is Eleanor Mount. I'm a senior at Granada High School and today I shadowed Jason Alcala, who is here. He's the city attorney. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a senior at Granada and I also shadowed John Marshall, our mayor. <coughs> Hi, I'm Katie. I shadowed Stephen Wilch. Oh, I'm from Granada High School. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give those youths a hand. I can tell you that uh, the youth are certainly uh, the leaders of tomorrow. And if today is any indication, uh, tomorrow is in very, very good hands. So, uh, Glad to have them as part of us today. So I'm going to do a short update on sort of what's happening around in the city. Um, give you folks a little bit of background about some of the things that can happen and are happening. It's about a four-hour presentation. <laughs> After that, I'll be ready to answer any questions. For those that are here, I'll be able to answer any questions. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with sort of uh, a little bit of background. Um, and talk about some organizational changes that happened this year. So the city is structured in a way to provide the highest quality service to our residents. The city council appoints <coughs> two employees, the city manager and the city attorney. Uh, this year, they appointed Jason Alcala as our new city attorney, replacing our retiring John Pomodor. Jason Alcala has been doing a fantastic job. He's not a, a new face to City Hall. He's been around for many years. And uh, he has definitely hit the ground running and keeping us all out of jail, so he's doing a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> Another, so far. So far. Thanks, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Another notable change for 2014 is that economic development has merged into the community development department. So this puts all of the development activities in one stop, creating sort of a one-stop shop for development activities. And as you'll soon see, they have had a very, very, very busy year. In addition, the City Council also appoints people to serve on nine boards and commissions uh, to help develop policy in the city. It really is a great way to get involved in, in policy setting and local politics here. Uh, here's my gratuitous plug. There are vacancies on many of these boards and commissions now. There's actually a vacancy on the Beautification Committee, on the Human Services Commission, and Livermore Housing Authority. So if you're interested in signing up for those, you can go to the city's website or contact the city clerk and and she'll get you in, in front of uh, the process to get that happen. There's also uh, three vacancies available on the Youth Advisory Commission. There are two adult positions available there, and then one youth position. And that's just a fun, as you can imagine, phenomenal commission to be involved in. So I want to talk a little bit about finances, because the last couple of times we've been here, that's been sort of the, the topic du jour. Uh, and as noted in the slide, the two biggest sources of revenue for the city is sales tax and property tax. And during the economic recession, those were the two that declined the most and, and the two that provided us with the most constraints. But we're beginning to see a rebound in both of those areas, uh, not only in terms of the volume of sales tax, but the diversity of the sales tax as well. We've had a number of different new businesses come in that are contributing to that. And our ability to accumulate uh, additional revenues through sales and property tax is directly correlated to our ability to provide great services to the residents. There's also a number of other revenue sources that the city uses, you can see, uh, that we get 10% of our funding from other governmental sources. We get 13% from other taxes like business license, hotel license taxes and things like that. And 16% of our revenues come from permits and fees. And when there's an uptick in that division, then we also experience uh, greater revenues and resources to deal with. So what do we do with this money? Where's the money go? Uh, we place a high emphasis on public safety. So about half of the general fund goes to police and fire. That's fairly common for cities uh, to place an emphasis on this area. Because, because of that, we all enjoy really a high quality of life for our residents and our citizens. And about 8% goes to administrative services, 5% to the library, 15% to community development. The important thing to take away from those slides for those folks that were paying attention is that that $77 million is balanced. So we're bringing in as much money as we're spending. And a few years ago, we were here talking about we were spending more money than we were bringing in. So we righted the ship there and things are well. Got a little bit more work to do, a little bit more lifting to do to protect ourselves for the future, but we're certainly headed in the right direction. I talk about the city's budget because it's the planning document that we use to implement the council, council's goals. It depicts what the, the city's council goals are, and it gives us the tools to implement those priorities. The budget's much like your own checkbook. I mean, if you opened up my checkbook, you could see where my priorities are, too. I have a teenage daughter in a house, and that's completely <laughs> very apparent <laughs> looking at my checkbook. Uh, so for 2014, you'll see that the council has identified those goals. I'm not sort of going to go into those. Uh, you know, really, enough about that. Let's sort of talk about what's been going on around town. Next slide, please. So Livermore Outlets has opened, and by all accounts, it's been a raging success. Uh, so successful that the owner there is moving forward with the phase two expansion of the Livermore Outlets. It's going to be directly east of the current project. Phase two will add about 200,000 square feet of retail space to the existing project. About 50 to 80 stores are going to go in there, depending on sort of how the market plays out. In addition, they're going to add additional parking, parking there as well. So the roadway and infrastructure improvements are underway, and building construction is expected to begin this spring, and hopefully with an opening date of 20, May of 2015. Once it's completed, you won't notice uh, the transition from phase one to phase two. It'll be fairly seamless as you walk down the courtyard there, uh, and it'll, it'll be a real enhancement to, the, to this project. <laughs> On the new business side, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings opened in the downtown uh, in a building next to Zephyr in the old bank. Uh, really happy that they're there, really pleased that they're there. Uh, the last word is open, and Panera has also opened in the old Chevy's building. And if you haven't noticed next to uh, Panera, 
Chipotle is going to be coming in there soon. And mm -hmm. Chipotle, uh, I, I was just introduced to it the first time about a month ago when I went shopping down in San Jose. My daughter dragged me in there, said, Dad, you got to have it. And I came back and put a little chair in front of Chipotle, and I will be there waiting for that place to open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also, there's a lot of, a lot of stores that are open. You'll, you'll see Livermore, to Livermore Toyota's on that list. <coughs> Livermore Toyota has opened, they actually have a grand opening and a ribbon cutting scheduled for tomorrow. I don't know how the timing of those things work out, but they're going to be there. It'll be a great community event, and they're going to be showcasing their 38,000 square foot uh, sh uh, showroom there. Toyota is a welcome addition to the Livermore family because they are the number one selling car in America for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because of their fuel efficiency, but you know they've just cornered the market in that, and they're doing very, very well. We're excited to have them. Also, for those of you that, that have your nose in sort of the business times on a regular basis, you'll see that Ronbo recently occupied some space out in the, uh, in, the, in the warehouse district or out in the industrial park. Ronbo produces high-end bathroom products. Now, it doesn't sound very exciting, certainly not as exciting as Chipotle, but anyone that brings in 180,000 square feet of distribution creates jobs in our community. So that's a very good thing. We're very excited about Ronbo being there and, and help, hoping that they get started soon. Where will they be? They'll be out in the industrial park. So out by uh, Risa and Hub Vasco and Nick and back in there. Next slide, please. Things have been busy, as I mentioned, in economic development. Uh, that division continues to work very closely with the Chamber of Commerce and Livermore Downtown Inc. to find ways to build on our economic vitality. We have staff that actually sit on committees there, and they're always strategizing on ways to improve the economic vitality of downtown. The Economic Development Department held a series of job fairs last year uh, as ways to connect uh, the business employers to the job base here in Livermore. And they've been very, very successful. Uh, in advance of the outlet malls opening, we had a few uh, job fairs where folks just showed up and got hired right there on the spot, so that was a good thing. And tomorrow, um, the mayor will be hosting a reception honoring the 100 top sales tax generators in the city and thanking them for choosing Livermore as their home. And this is important that we recognize those folks. It's because of them that they're able to provide the city with the resources that we have to go out and provide the, the, the exceptional services that the city has to offer. Next slide. There's a number of other upcoming projects that are exciting. Um, Mark Livermore, we've never been closer. Never been closer. Project level EIR. Uh, we'll be looking at the bar well, extension from Dublin to years. Isabel. Now, that's a really, really <laughs> important like milestone uh, because once you get the EIR, you can pretty much get into uh, project design there. So that's an effort that's going to be going on over the next several several months, probably a year and a half. Um, and we're really excited about that and it continues to move forward. It's a really important initiative. As far as Fire Station 9, um, the council also wants us to look at some of the local facilities that we own, and Fire Station 9 is certainly on that list. It's one of the oldest fire stations that we have in the city, and it really does need to be upgraded. Um, it needs to be upgraded to meet some seismic requirements, and the last time I was there, I was really surprised to find out that there just are no co-ed facilities in there, and we certainly have co-ed firefighters. So it's for the reasons like that, that we need to be looking at upgrading that facility and there's going to be uh, money well spent there. You know, firefighting just isn't the same as it was in the 60s and 70s when this facility was constructed. Where is it at? Fire Station 9 is on Cordoba. If you go uh, down Concanon, oh, yeah. past, uh, oh, yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 It used to be close to where you were. It used to be close to right there. Right around <clears throat> We're also looking at, um, and we have under construction right now, a new airport administration building. Now that's not as exciting as sort of it sounds, but here's the exciting part. There's actually room set aside in the administration building for a restaurant. So there's going to be a restaurant out at the airport administration building, and I think the pilots are going to like that, and they land. It'll sort of create greater synergies between the golf course and the outlet mall and that whole little area. So that's going to be a really, really good project. And then at the old library, we're currently going through a feasibility study to look at the library at the Civic Center site to come up with some ideas about what to do with that. Possibly make it in council chambers and uh, create additional space for a community meeting room. 
which would get us out of our temporary council chambers that we're in now that have been temporary for about 20 years. <laughs> we have probably one of the only temporary council chambers that might make it on the historic register. <laughs> so, next slide, please. Right down the street, we have the uh, Springtown Easy Access Library. This really is sort of an innovative library design where you can sort of drop in with an easy access card and take advantage of services at any time of the day. It was so innovative that <laughs> as the project was moving forward, I was always check in with the library director and say, hey, how's the easy access library coming? And she said, well, it's not easy or accessible. <laughs> but we are there now. Uh, we, using a secured key card access, you can go there and check out DVDs, you can check out magazines, return items, and pick up any items that were ordered from the Civic Center Library. We've issued about 200 key cards to date, and the, the facility is accessible from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, and it's receiving really, really heavy use, so we're excited about that. Also on the library side, they're going through and looking at the services offered in the library. They are in the middle of a survey to survey the residents and the users of the library, see what's working, what's not working well, and where they should be allocating their resources. So once the findings of that are finished, we should have a much more robust, more focused library system that meets the needs of the community. On the public safety side, uh, you know we share a fire department with the city of Pleasanton. That helps us not only share and, and control our costs, but it also helps us uh, provide resources on a much broader scale. We have a lot more uh, accessibility to resources than by having our own standalone department. So this year we moved over the financing of that. It sounds easier than it was, you know, but to pick up sort of a $25 million object and move it to another city is pretty daunting. But in sharing the facility and sharing the department and sharing the financing of it, it really does start to feel like sort of a true joint department there. Mm. And also, the fire department joined ACRAC, which is the Alameda County Regional <coughs> Communications System this year. That's the department that does the dispatching of fire. Previously, uh, the Livermore Police Department dispatched for the fire department. But now that, they're, now that you have sort of all of the fire safety people from the county in one spot, it really does help provide better coverage for fire services and better communication. On the police side, Yes. Is that uh, tied into the laboratories fire department also? Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, yes, they do uh, with the labs because the labs contract out with the county, so they're all. The question is: the question, does ACRAC also dispatch for the labs? Is right. that the question? Yes. So ACRAC does the labs because the county is in ACRAC, which is the dispatch center, and the county police is the one that does fire for the labs. Okay. So they're all. They're all talking on the same wavelength now. On the police side, uh, this year they've implemented a number of programs for, for quality of life. They just gave a presentation at the council meeting last night on the crime-free multi-housing program. And this is a program that gives uh, multi-family uh, managers and property owners tools to evict those folks that aren't playing well in the sandbox with the rest of us. Uh, it really is a voluntary program so far. There are about five five multi-family units that have signed up for it. It's going very well, and we hope to bring those on, bring more on this year. Also on the police side, um, we recognize two of our own Livermore's finest, officers uh, Zagoric and Yost, for their work out at the outlet malls. And they are strategically engaged in working with the outlet malls in the community and getting their word out uh, about uh, education and enforcement and the things that you can do to protect yourselves and your belongings out of the outlet malls. Bloomingdale's recognized them on a national basis and we recognized them as well. And they received, uh, they were awarded the 2013 Employee Awards of Excellence for their efforts out there. So there really is a lot of communication going on between the outlet malls and the police department. Next. There's a number of community events that we're all looking forward to hosting. I mean, there is literally something for everyone that's going to be happening this year. Uh, the Wine Festival, which we all know is the first weekend in May, is attracting 200,000 visitors from the downtown during this two-day event. It features many of uh, Livermore's local wineries and, and breweries. The Little League World Series is coming back. This will be the second year here. Uh, this inaugural event last year was held at Max Bear Park. Over 36,000 people came out to watch the games 
in over seven days. So they brought fans from all around the world with them. We were showcased all over ESPN. I went home one afternoon and turned on ESPN and said, oh, there's the Little League World Series, and got off the couch and went right down to Max Mayer Park and had a great day. For you scientists <coughs> out there, uh, Livermore does have its own element on the periodic table of elements. We are element number 116, or LV. And May 30th has been declared Livermorium Day. So on June 24, 2013, the plaza at Mill Squares Park, which is just across the street from the fountain of downtown at First Balloon, it was dedicated as Livermore, Livermorium Plaza. So we're going to have an annual celebration out there in partnership with the school district and with the labs. And it's going to be this year, I believe it's May 30th, and it will be at Livermorium Plaza. Now, it's, it's Purely coincidental. Now here's a little piece of trivia for you. How many folks know the address of Mill Square Plaza? 116. 116. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're at element number 116 and Mill Square Park is 116. So it was meant to be. <laughs> in Livermore, we're going to have a half marathon. LDI is sponsoring a half marathon in the downtown. And it will be this Saturday from March 29th. So I'll be out there. I won't be running. That's a long drive. <laughs> I'll be downtown, sort of enjoying, enjoying the festivities and having breakfast with the folks. Coming. On the art side, uh, you may have noticed that there have been some utility boxes that have been painted. Uh, those look great, and they came out great. Those were all sponsored by uh, community members that volunteered their time and money to go out there and, and paint those. Five artists will be painting an, an additional seven utility boxes in phase two of this program. The boxes are going to be primarily located on Holmes Avenue around Stanley Boulevard in that area. This is really done through a collaborative effort with the Livermore Arts community which has rallied around this process and it really gives folks an opportunity to express themselves and at the same time beautify the city. So it's really a win-win. And on the Livermore and Public Art, I just talked about Mill Square. Uh, we just completed a nationwide search for an artist to create a public art installation. It's going to go in at Mill Squares Park to commemorate the discovery of Livermoreum. Um, the artwork will be incorporated into the full redesign of the plaza. And uh, over 150 artists from 34 states applied. And they got grilled and put through a very rigorous process. Um, and we're going to come up with an outstanding one. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. The, the final design of it will be shown at Livermoreum Day, which is going to be May 30th at Mill Squares Park. You also notice up on that picture, and, and if you haven't noticed, it's been in the newspaper and it's all around town, the Bankhead Theater. Uh, this is a community asset that we all absolutely value very much. Um, and in particular, the city is absolutely aware of the financial pressures that are facing the Bankhead right now. I will say that we have been actively engaged in discussions with both LVPAC and the county to try and find a solution to the theater's financial problems. Uh, if the negotiations show promise, they will absolutely, absolutely lead to a public discussion about what any solution will look like. So, you know, we're, gonna, we're not over here. Uh, we're not even sort of at the finish line. And when you do, when we get there, you'll know. And you'll hopefully all come out and provide your, your input on that. Right now, if there's one thing I could say, it's that the discussions are highly fluid and the parties are trying to find sort of common ground. It really is a, an interesting dynamic to be involved in because the city is really not party to the, to the debt that's going on, but we're absolutely interested. Uh, imagine if your, if your vehicle was sort of getting repossessed, you know, or your son's vehicle was getting repossessed, and then your friend Billy said, oh, don't worry, I'm going to call the bank and take care of it. So there's a lot of moving dynamic parts to that. It's a very complicated thing, but rest assured you've got Livermore's best and brightest on it. And the good thing is that at least at this time, everyone's sort of rowing in the same direction. So I wanted to mention that. Uh, the last goal that I mentioned, or that you saw of the council, was to engage residents. And we do a lot there. Um, we use technology to the extent that we can to engage residents. We've been reaching out through a community newsletter. Uh, that you see there goes out to every home in Livermore. Uh, and we've recently, you'll see one probably this week in your mailbox if you haven't seen one. And we also use an ele electronic newsletter for those folks who like to get news electronically. So you can go to the website, sign up, and that will just appear in your inbox, and you'll have the latest news going on. 
about what's happening in City Hall. <coughs> and last slide, please. And for those of you that are social media advocates like myself, I just can't seem to keep up with the technology there. Uh, the city does use a number of social media outlet, outlets like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Nixle. We have our own YouTube page so you can go there and watch videos. If you don't know what any of this stuff is, ask these guys. I'm sure they, I'm sure they all know and they probably tell you how, how Facebook and all that stuff works. So as you can see, it's been a very productive year in the city. There's been a lot going on. Um, I do have a couple of minutes, so I'll take a couple of questions, but before I do that, um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one of your own members um, and my boss, Mark Roberts. So I won't go into the details of sort of the woes about how Mark is doing and the situation that led him up to it, but you know that Mark is on an extended medical leave, has been on one since February. Uh, Mark is doing absolutely well. I've seen him uh, a number of times. I saw him uh, just two weeks ago, and uh, I had family with him, and I had dinner with him and his family. And I learned one thing, I need to take more food next time. <laughs> his, his appetite is just ferocious. He's eating like a teenage boy. He's healthy. In fact, I talked to Mark on Saturday and he said if he only had to work a half an hour a day, he'd be back right now. But we expect a little bit more out of our employees. So we're going we're gonna to wait for him to come back. And right now, all things are on track for Mark to come back in the first part of May. We're excited about that. And he sends his absolute best. And every time I see him, I tell him that everyone says hi. Um, and, he, and he's very appreciative of that. So with that, thank you again for hosting us today. And we look forward to uh, your continued participation. We've got time for, for a couple of questions. Yes. What is happening to our music downtown? To the music downtown? You know, I've, I've heard that. I haven't heard a lot about uh, the specifics of what's going on. I, I have heard that there are those that are concerned with the sound of the music and, the, and coming from downtown and the businesses. We have not been approached and asked about that. We, we don't permit that. But I am, I am hearing that there's something going on with it. I, I couldn't answer the specifics. Uh, the rumors going around that, uh, that it's being discontinued. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that. And I, I, can't, I can't confirm it because we don't, we don't permit it. But I've, I've heard that. Um, and I, I understand that there's some concerns with some of the businesses and some of the musicians. So I could find out. I, I don't know. Yeah. I understand there's going to be a community conversation about the homeless problem. There is. Thank you very much for that. The, the mayor is hosting a homeless forum. Uh, it's going to be at the Robert Livermore Community Center. And at the forum, he will be bringing out a number of service providers from not only the city, but the county. And one of the outcomes from that will be ways that we can partner together and work together um, to reduce homelessness and provide greater services to those that need it. Um, he hopes to have folks, and we're inviting folks from the federal government, from the Veterans Administration, from the county, uh, from all, all facets of that to sort of cover uh, the myriad of issues that are associated with it. But you have a date for that? April 30th at the Robert Livermore Community Center. Is that a confirmed date? That's now? a confirmed date now. Okay. And, we, and we, had the date, we had the date before. We picked uh, Good Friday yeah. as one day, and then it changed. But <laughs> April 30th is a date that I know of right now. More to come on that, so please stay, stay engaged and uh, keep watching the website and the press releases. We'll do a full court press on that as it gets closer. Yes? Several days ago, uh, I noticed that there's some construction going on, on old, off of Old First Street. Uh, I went up over the overpass and I noted that the ground had been completely leveled and they're starting doing some work. What type of work is this going to be done? That is work that you're going to start to see in a few different places around the Rumor. That is a, a residential uh, housing development going there that will look pretty much like it looks on the left side of the street. So they've, they've submitted a few different maps. Um, it's going to be mainly sort of condominium type places. The first map they submitted did not include uh, parcels sort of toward the north, toward the bridge. Uh, it did not include uh, the car wash. They have since then changed the project and expanded it a little bit. Uh, so they have acquired the car wash. And they're going to be demolishing that. That whole thing will look like exactly 
like it looks on the left side there. I think it's Palisage. It's really a great project, and I think that's a, an important corridor, and it's really going to make a, a, that whole sort of entryway in the downtown look really good. One more. I see that um, with the build out coming in, with the different businesses coming in, they're coming in with jobs and with uh, revenue from the standpoint of business products. Strategically thinking, how they're coming in with jobs, how are we working or how is the city working with the school districts and with the community college to develop that workforce that they're going to need through ROP type program strategies? You know, I remember that question last year and, and I, I have sort of the same answer. Uh, and that is that there's a number of different ways, and that's uh, because there's different levels of jobs. So on, on the STEM side, you know, the school district is clearly working with the labs and the state and, and even at the national level to create uh, an engaged and, and smart um, student population to be able to transition onto the STEM side. Um, we also partner with the county, um, as I mentioned, some of the job fairs, to provide sort of that, that also industrial touch to it. So when we hold our job fairs, one of the things that we do is we look at not only sort of all facets of it, but we partner with the, with the, the schools, we partner with the colleges as well. Um, here's an example. We partnered with the college and the veterans group with the job fair <coughs> the outlet malls on the construction side. So there's a whole lot of community conversations that happen between the school district, between the county, and between the city to make sure that our workforce is prepared for any level of job that comes up there. Sort of the same answer I gave last year. Thank you again very much for having me. Thank you. Okay, so Phil says I have my choice of olive oil or wine. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.